Welcome and thank you for joining us for Spotlight on Urban Tech in Europe, the virtual series. Uh, the webinar dated the 19th of November 2020, entitled What Goals Can Be Achieved by Deploying Urban Technologies? We have some fantastic expert panellists for you again today, who we will introduce in a moment. My name is Christina C, and my company C Intelligence started this project with Pascal Blaker from Full Global, along with our independent advisors, with the aim to create connections and new opportunities, share insights and knowledge within the urban tech community. The project includes a series of webinars on a monthly basis, uh, with a follow-up expert insights document, where you will be able to read more from our panellists and other guest interviewees. And we will also have a survey and in June next year we will conclude with a final report and an event to bring everyone together, hopefully in person. Please visit the website urbantech.world to find out more about us and view options for partnerships and getting involved. Follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter and please subscribe to our YouTube channel urbantech.world to view the recording after the event. I'll hand over now to Pascal who can just help introduce each of our panelists. Thank you, Christina. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this live webinar of Spotlight on Urban Tech in Europe. My name is Pascal Bleker, and I'm the co-founder of 4Global and passionate about technology and cities. Technologies are rapidly changing our lives and societies every day and everywhere. So in this webinar, we have an amazing group of experts who share with us their insights on what goals can be achieved by deploying urban technologies. The second wave of COVID-19 also impacted us. We had to postpone this webinar by one week due to multiple panelists being hit by Corona. But the contributions by those who couldn't make today will be included in the expert insights afterwards. Today's webinar will cover which goals cities can achieve by making full use of urban technologies. And we already received a few questions for our panel, but more questions are welcome. So if you have a question for our panel, please share with me via the chat functionality as we end the webinar with a Q&A. Well, the, the webinar will take in total 45 minutes and will be moderated by Yona Shore of Urban Impact. And now, without further ado, let me give the floor to our panelists who will briefly introduce themselves. Uh, can I start with you, Heba? Yes, sure. Hello. Uh, so this is Heba Aguib. Um, I'm the chief executive of the Respond Accelerator program um, of the BMW Foundation uh, and responsible for bringing technology innovations for societal and environmental challenges um, to be empowered, uh, empower entrepreneurs um, uh, uh, and technology to be used uh, for the sake of society and uh, the good of our, uh, for our better future. <laughs> Happy to be with you. Thank you, Eva. And Cassie, can I continue with you? Hi, Cassie Welling. Um, I'm the CEO of uh, Havadava. Um, Havadava is a Munich-based company or startup um, digitizing pollution management and monitoring, um, basically to help uh, decarbonize our, our future cities. Um, so our air quality insights platform is based on a series of different technologies, so IoT sensing, um, but also data science, AI, and satellite technology. Um, and as a first step, we basically provide near real time, street level data on when, where, how and why pollution is occurring. Um, and then we work with cities and our partners to co-develop um, relevant municipal tools to help guide effective investment to, to tackle air pollution. Thanks. Hey, thanks a lot, Cassie. Yuri, could you also introduce yourself? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Yuri. I am from Kyiv, Ukraine. I am head of Kyiv Smart City Initiative. Uh, our main task is uh, to connect uh, local authorities, uh, civil society, and promote smart city solution in uh, Ukrainian cities. Uh, past five years, I worked for uh, Kyiv Smart City Council, and uh, I was CIO of uh, Kyiv Smart City Council, and uh, we realized a lot of smart city projects and uh, took the 92 position in top uh, 100 ranking of smart cities. Yeah, and uh, uh, our main activity is promotion of smart city in Ukraine. Well, thanks a lot, Yuri. Well, thank you all for introducing yourself from our panelists. Then I would like to hand over to uh, Jonas. Jonas, our moderator. Jonas will also briefly introduce himself and then uh, well, guide you through today's session. Thanks a lot. 
Perfect. Thanks a lot, Pascal. Thanks again also, Christina, to um, invite me. So my name is Jonas. Um, I'm co-founder of um, Urban Impact. We're an innovation platform also focused on urban tech, trying to stitch together the ecosystem. It's really cool to um, now have this discussion also with you, Yuri, Cassie, Eber, and um, yeah, just not to waste any, any valuable time. Um, let's jump straight uh, into it. And um, maybe stay with the topic of COVID. Um, you know, all of us know kind of that it has impacted our cities. Some even speak of post COVID cities, trying to imagine what, what will be the long-term uh, impact of, of all of it as it has changed in terms of our behavior, in terms of new processes, new technologies being adapted. And um, so my first question would actually be to you also, Eber, coming from the perspective maybe uh, from Munich, where you are also based with, with your work, um, uh, how do you perceive the impact that COVID had already had on the city of Munich and, and maybe innovation uh, uh, processes as such? Thank you, Jonas. Um, first of all, I would like to say that it's been a very hard time for uh, the society having COVID here. Like, despite every um, uh, positive development I would mention in, in the coming words, um, I really want to acknowledge how difficult it is for uh, a lot of uh, um, of people to be coping um, from a work perspective, from a, a business perspective, uh, and all of that. And um, it shows, uh, COVID showed us internationally that our um, economic systems are very fragile and very not inclusive and need to be transformed even stronger. The, the, the issue of transformation needs to be um, uh, looked into, um, which also led to a positive acceleration of a lot of solutions or a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, positive developments in favor of climate action, in favor of um, uh, digital transformation, etc. So um, it has a, a positive side effect in terms of being aware and feeling the urge of implementing solutions uh, from a technological perspective, from a society inclusion perspective in development and innovations. Munich has a very strong innovation cluster, uh, is known for its universities and technologies and, and, and companies and, and uh, production. And there, Sustainability became very important. A lot of topics of the EU and German wide or Germany wide on uh, digital um, and green twinning um, uh, and how to uh, support startups uh, and small and uh, medium businesses in order to be even more active and contribute to the transformation. A lot of that happened during the COVID time. Um, we launched the Respond Accelerator earlier this year, independent from Corona, but going through it digitally, it was so much. Um, it was much more possible to even embed more international players with our partners, uh, digital conferencing like Bits and Pretzels and others. Um, it, it, it gave a lot of opportunity to be acting from Munich, supporting startups and entrepreneurship and the ecosystem and bringing a lot of international activities to Munich. And uh, finally, I would like to say that we launched this year um, at the uh, Creative Bureaucracy uh, Festival, the Rise City uh, program. Uh, resilient, uh, intelligent, sustainable, equitable cities, uh, led by my colleague Kerstin von Aretin. And the focus is on um, creating um, a platform to show best practice examples and include society for uh, uh, and innovation, bring them together to uh, what the citizens need, because this is a focus. And now with COVID, it's even shown to be more important than ever. It's been always important, but now people understand that it's a necessity to include um, all the, the citizens and society. Um, so this is uh, in brief, uh, and uh, I encourage you to read the Tech for Good report we launched last uh, week because it has a lot of aspects of impact technologies and innovations to be implemented in cities and possibilities uh, through Corona and through other challenges. Eva, yeah, we've also had a touch point earlier this year during the um, Via versus Virus Hackathon, where also your, your team uh, was heavily involved supporting social civil society initiatives, trying to figure out some, um, some new solutions, not all digital, but like digitally enabled teamwork, let's say, figuring out new solutions to, you know, the changing issues that we now have. 
Um, is there anything that sticks out from you just, you know, outside your doorstep, let's say one of the uh, uh, projects maybe that, that you just think is, is, you know, particularly powerful or impactful? Thank you for mentioning this, Jonas. Uh, the V versus Virus was really a great initiative and it shows then when politics, society and technology developers and institutions and foundations work together, you can accelerate a lot of solutions to be embedded for the sake of crisis and non-crisis. I really want to highlight that we need to act differently to be always ready not to just react to crises and one of them is like the digital waiting room uh Jonas from the via versus virus a solution which is embedded in munich and in other cities in, in germany to to enhance the uh, uh patients uh, waiting uh, times and allow more digital uh, uh medicine so there were so many in ad tech um, um I, i think it was a great initiative to show how valuable it is if we all decide to work on the same um, challenge, right? And there are enough challenges to work on. Um, and, and yeah, this is um, a good example. Thank you for asking. Fantastic. And I'll, I'll actually come back to this point of like, you know, how at least it seems like this crisis has brought us all a bit closer together to, to get out every one of, of their comfort zone and, and reaching out to, to the different parts of Uh, you know, that, that make up the, let's say, um, uh, our cities, the different uh, institutions and so on. Um, but uh, I'll actually pass on also now to, uh, to Yuri. Um, how was it in Ukraine? What was, what has, has any, anything changed, like anything changed in, in terms of the discussion on the ground? You have also, what's very special about your work, Yuri, is that you actually drove the smart city agenda, the urban tech agenda from inside the city first, but now also you are um, focusing on all of Ukraine. You are actually connecting this ecosystem also from the outside. Um, so I would, I would love to hear um, uh, from your perspective also um, uh, what's going on in, in, in Kiev and in, and in Ukraine more generally. Yeah, we saw that the uh, world has changed and uh, we should change the approach uh, to uh, modern life Yeah, in, in all of areas, in uh, uh, workspace, in uh, transport, in public places, etc., etc. And the uh, pandemic uh, forces uh, uh, municipality to uh, improve uh, innovations in the city, uh, to build uh, and to uh, change uh, the environment. Uh, of work uh, forces, etc. Uh, pandemia uh, pan pandemia uh, forces uh, companies to be more flexible, to be more innovate and uh, uh, to start collaboration. And uh, of course, our city uh, was not ready to uh, new conditions of living, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, uh, our urban, urban infrastructure was not ready to, yeah? And uh, we would like to change our vision, uh, our business processes, our vision of future living, our uh, vision of collaboration and internal business processes too, workflow, planning, organization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but uh, in project of Kiev Smart City, we started a lot of uh, electronic services that uh, make something easily uh, to live in modern uh, conditions. Yeah. Uh, in different areas. Yeah. For example, medicine. We started telemedicine in some hospital and uh, it supports citizens to contact to doctors online. Or, or for example, uh, booking the time of arrival to doctor online. Yeah. In this case, you would not like to wait uh, the doctor in the room and uh, contact with uh, potential infections people. Yeah, for example, in transport, we implemented e-ticket uh, uh, system where can you pay uh, using banking card, QR code, etc., or you can enrich your account in a mobile application. We implemented e-parking, yeah, where you can pay uh, for parking from mobile application. Uh, for example, uh, we launched uh, Cabinet of Citizen and mobile application where, uh, where can we... Uh, As I, as I told, uh, book uh, as a time of arrival to the doctor, order a child to kindergarten, uh, pay online for municipal services, uh, vote, for example, for uh, participating budget projects, uh, to receive different uh, uh, documents online. 
and uh, uh, of course uh, seriously change living in uh, uh, environment and in uh, for example uh, we did not be able to go to restaurant uh, to cafes and think that uh, was born extremely uh, different services like uh, of uh, delivery yeah like uber eats like uh, raketa globo yeah uh, and uh, uh, began to uh, use public transport dangerously too and uh, support us in this uh, project like uh, bike sharing. Yeah, we have about 600 uh, bikes in our city. Or uh, Bolt uh, implemented project with uh, uh, scooters, electro scooters. And, uh, you know, we, we, we had uh, serious problems to rent a bike or, <laughs> or scooter. And of course, we changed uh, the communication, internal communication. Uh, in Kyiv City Council, we have more than 4,000 uh, employees. And all of uh, these employees should start uh, uh, to work remotely. And uh, we implemented till that time uh, unified communications, yeah, like emails, like uh, uh, Skype for business. And uh, till that time, we implemented a workflow system where you can uh, uh, work with electronic documents and using electronic sign, you can sign remotely from uh, your apartments, for example. And so, uh, let me, let me, sorry, let me just come in here because I find it very interesting. I think everything you are describing now, it's you know, I think that this probably we have seen it not just across Europe, we have probably seen it also across the whole world, how the whole public sector side of things, right, how they were forced to simply shake things up. In Berlin, there has actually, where, where we I'm based, um, there have been also big discussions about this because people were also not, uh, you know, like in, incredibly prepared. So I think at the beginning, you know, I think it was maybe it was the minority of people who had access to all the digital tools they needed to even work from home and keep the city running in this sense. And what I would love to know from, know from you also, um, how, how did the citizens respond? How do you think like, how did the population actually respond to all those new digital services? Because there's obviously, um, you know, not everyone is familiar with them. Um, not everyone finds it easy sometimes also to interact with that. And um, I, um, you know, I would love to hear how just the citizens of, of Kiev, if they are very responsive to this and they embrace it and, you know, um, or if they have hesitations that you are seeing and witnessing. Uh, uh, yeah, of course, uh, all of innovations uh, from beginning is something hard to use, uh, but till the time uh, about 30% of our citizens use uh, online services. Uh, but you know we had have very serious problem in, in education area yeah we have uh, for example in kiev we have uh, half thousand uh, schools yeah and uh, and and uh, the more than uh, uh, 300000 childs who studied in this school and all schools was stopped and that's why uh, we had problem to start uh, e learning yeah uh, for uh, for childs and uh, and uh, for your information, for example, only 1% of schools, yeah, five schools was ready to start e-learning for childs. And this was problem uh, for teachers, for childs, for parents, uh, b b uh, basically for parents of childs. And uh, in two months, unfortunately, only uh, after two months, uh, we connected all schools to internet, yeah. We installed the learning platform uh, where uh, childs can uh, learn different uh, different programs and uh, we implemented immediately system where can we control the study process yeah with uh, e-diary uh, and, and other tools yeah and and it was very big problem yeah but thanks for sharing yeah i think this is also the whole educational sector for sure uh, yeah. big challenges also not just right for 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 the uh, the students let's say but also for the parents and the the teachers uh, involved a big learning curve for sure. Um, I want to move on to a little bit different topic. Um, as you all know, as urban urban experts, um, you know most of the challenges we have in cities they're usually intertwined. They're not standalone. And speaking of COVID, you know there was just recently also this uh, big study published linking the effects of air quality to more severe cases of COVID. And it's something that. In some cases, though, we have stopped thinking so much about, about uh, 
the issue of air quality. And so I'm super happy to also have you, Cassie, here um, to um, tell us a little bit more about the work you're doing, what you've learned about air pollution in cities as a challenge, because it is a challenge not just here in Europe, but, but everywhere. Um, and yeah, what, just what you believe we can achieve by using new technology, solving, let's say, an old problem. And um, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, and maybe to sort of follow on from, from the COVID uh, conversation and, and Jonas, you, you mentioned quite rightly that there's there's been quite a lot of research spent um, looking into the correlation between, for example, air pollution episodes and, and COVID contraction and recovery rates. Um, it's still very much sort of up in the air in terms of the very clear correlations um, and peer reviewed studies and so on. Um, but I think, for example, last month, the German cardiologist announced that 15% of COVID deaths are due to air pollution. I mean, it's pretty unequivocal there. Um, it's clear that there is um, a strong link between, you know, respiratory sensitivity and risk and air pollution. And, and I think COVID has been, you know, a time in which air pollution has very much come to the fore in many people's um, minds and in, in the, the minds of, of cities as well. Um, how do we deal with our post-COVID reality? How do we deal with a sustainable future? And, and what role does air pollution and sort of monitoring and managing air pollution um, play in that context? So I think that's a very topical, topical point. Um, and maybe maybe moving a little bit to our experience of, of um, maybe the last sort of five, ten years or so, or at least, you know, the last three or four years um, in which we've been active in, in the market. Um, so perhaps we, we sort of view the historic um, role of air quality data as very much a sort of reporting purpose, rather more academic research focused um, a mix of, of digital services and analog um, so it's not purely digital yet um, it's moving in that direction there are many cities across the world who are starting to digitize their systems or at least complement their analog systems with with many sort of new digital services and technologies for monitoring air, air quality um, and basically where we're sort of coming into the market is by saying okay we, we can still do something with with how you're monitoring to date um, but we can add value to it. We can already sort of do interesting analyses um, on that data, plus add a much more digital approach to it. Um, and we see that changing quite a lot over time. So let's say bringing from the sort of historic view into the current view, um, obviously air quality is now making headlines across the world. We've got Dieselgate, <laughs> we've got air quality emergencies being announced in the UK, for example. Um, I think you've already mentioned um, you know, World Health Organization. I think their, their latest figure is nine in 10 people across the world are, are breathing polluted air. You know, this isn't insignificant. Um, there's, you know, the, the issue of, of continued and um, significant disparity when it comes to air quality. So it tends to be that the urban poor or those in much poorer uh, countries are still very much disproportionately impacted and affected by, by air quality. So it's, it's making the headlines, it's, it's very much a sort of topical um, or, or very, you know, a topical uh, topic. <laughs> um, and as a result, I think the market is changing quite, quite a lot. So we're already seeing a lot of new players coming into the market, startups um, in the same sort of position as us. Um, there are now things like hackathons focused purely on how we can use air quality data to, for social and environmental good. Um, there's also a much bigger drive from, for example, cities and municipal partners for um, hyperlocal data for um, taking effective decisions um, and making much more efficient investments uh, to tackle air pollution and other um, environmental or climate related topics. Um, everything has to now be, you know, impact driven. It has to be, it has to be effectively measured. It has to have a success metric associated to it. Um, and I think also we're moving very much more towards being recognized as a company that can sort of offer a proactive approach to monitoring and to measuring air um, quality as opposed to purely reactive, um, as I think uh, Huber mentioned earlier. And for that, you need data. Um, all of these decisions need to, need to be data driven. Um, I think a couple more topics um, that we're seeing at the moment. So there's very much a sort of breaking down of silos, um, new operating models, new collaborations, which I think um, Yuri mentioned already, new partnerships, um, making it much more possible, for example, to pool funding, to pool resources, bring in public private um, sector partners into the mix. Um, and I think a very important topic to note um, is that 
technologies now have to be interoper interoperable. They have to be able to scale and be replicable. Um, and I think that's relevant um, for both the private sector, but now increasingly more so for the, for the public sector. So our data now has to integrate with, for example, healthcare systems or electronic health records, but also with traffic management systems. Um, it has to sort of speak <laughs> to the systems that you know, are now integrating these, these new types of data. Um, and I think maybe looking forward towards the, the, the future, just to sort of finalize um, um, our experience, certainly of, of the air quality markets in this space. Satellite technology is, is bringing um, a lot of hope for us. Um, so new types of satellites, which um, basically provide a much higher granularity of data, um, I think will change the face of air quality monitoring. We're already started, starting to do something in that space, both for cities, but for, for other markets as well. You know, as we've mentioned, COVID is going to have a big impact. How do we deal with that new um, burden of responsibility and, and cost on the healthcare system, this new um, respiratory needs? Um, but I think also positively coming out of this, um, there's, a now, there's now a changing focus. I think COVID has sort of really changed the way that we might approach some of these topics. So we're now talking about data ownership and where we get that data and how we use that data. We're talking about citizen science and engagement. Uh, we're talking about well-being as a as a critical you know socioeconomic factor, placemaking, lifestyle, um, and air quality is now definitely a sort of quality of life indicator as opposed to just a, a peripheral topic that that is measured by scientists. Great, thank you so much, Cassie. What I wanted to ask you also is how do you see it actually changing in terms of perception also from you know, you are very much like you You have a, a product, a technology, a solution, let's say, that requires this like reciprocal interest from the public sector. And you briefly touched on like this public-private collaboration. Um, do you see a step change there currently? Because maybe now there is more awareness and there is this maybe shared language of data. Um, but it also depends on, right, like two sides coming together, meeting each other, being capable and uh, receptive in that very moment. Um, do you see any, any, any changes there or it's been pretty much the same as, I don't know, for the last couple of years? No, I, th I think you're right. I think um, there's definitely an interest from, for example, the private sector to um, get involved in, for example, air quality monitoring or environmental analytics and data. Um, I think there's a need um, to focus a lot more, for example, on, on staff well-being, on um, corporate reporting, on positioning, on all of that stuff, which actually feels a little bit like lip service in many cases, but is actually contributing to a much broader move towards, let's say, the, the net um, carbon, the, the zero uh, carbon economy um, decarbonisation agenda. Um, and I think once these larger companies um, are starting to sort of you know, come on board to that, it makes it then much easier um, as a smaller company to, to really sort of position yourselves in the market as experts in that particular area. I think that's, that's one, one thing. I think on the other side, um, there are new collaborations um, coming up, such as, for example, in, in the UK, an initiative called Breathe London, which brings together the public sector, private sector research um, into monitoring air quality across the entirety of London. Um, there's Climate Trace, which is a new initiative, which is funded or supported, I think, by, by the Al Gore, um, to look at monitoring all of the emissions from power plants across um, the entire globe. Um, it's a model-based approach, um, but it's still a very new thing. No one's done this before. It's very exciting. Um, then there's initiatives such as Open Air Quality or Open AQ, um, which is effectively a community of um, air quality practitioners across yeah, public sector, private sector, um, research sector, all of whom are interested in engaging and collaborating on a completely new level. And I think people are now realizing that you know, air quality requires that multiplicity of, of you know approaches it it can't just be dealt with by an NGO on the ground um, and a, a government funding pot great thank you so much um, maybe again let's uh, let's broaden a little bit because we we want to talk today more broadly also about urban different urban tech topics another interesting one that's uh, where also Munich is is becoming like one of the centers uh, here by now um, uh, thinking more like a question towards you maybe um, in terms of like it's also becoming leading European hub for clean tech companies and also even the Bavarian Ministry of Economic Affairs recently has set like quite high standards for energy policy. Um, but I know you with the foundation, the work you do with the accelerator, 
you are really like looking at different disruptive trends. And I would just love to see, to hear from you also, like how do you think will clean tech, how can it impact locally um, Munich, but then maybe also what you are just seeing as like hot topics, hot trends right now in, in this field. Um, thank you, Jonas. I really like uh, catching up what, what Cassidy was said because, has said because Howard was also an, a, a startup of the um, with us in the uh, Respond Accelerator this year, it's, and it's a great example for uh, 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 an AI technology, uh, hardware, and software combination to tackle an issue which is related to cities, to health, to uh, um, uh, clean uh, uh, tech, uh, it's a multi-solution, so to say, uh, between uh, many areas. And, and I see a lot of um, development in terms of uh, sustainability, trying to uh, um, uh, have the Paris Agreement implemented uh, to 2050, uh, to um, 2050, um, the, the, the Green Deal, a lot of initiatives, a lot of uh, uh, funding, but I really want to see uh, focused, more focused investments uh, going there. I think there is a time, there is a bit of a time lag in reaching uh, startups and reaching uh, um, um, uh, uh, practice. And, and there is, you, you also see a big transformation of the industries here in Munich, uh, putting sustainability at a strategy uh, clean technology, the whole transformation. So it's a transformation on many levels. You need to channel and intensify the support. Um, um, and some examples from the Respond Accelerator, like Made of Air is also uh, a startup um, developed a CO2 negative material from uh, biochar or um, Plan A having a, a CO2 um, um, a reducing artificial intelligence platform for companies and uh, um, to reduce their emission and, and find solutions and ways to deal with it. So there's so much happening on the digital technology side. There's so much happening on the hardware side. And actually, you need to take very much care of the uh, ad advancement you had over years here in terms of innovation and tech and hardware and develop it further to be clean and advanced. So I'm, I'm happy to see the development of Munich to be attracting more startups, to be uh, um, uh, raising the competitiveness of Europe in terms of solutions for clean tech and innovations. Um, but we need, really need to invest even more in, in entrepreneurial um, initiatives, in, um, uh, in competence building in order to um, um, uh, empower people to cope with the transformation needed. Um, is it a digital one? Is it a societal transformation? Um, inspire them with the topic of leadership, like how to be responsibly leading in whatever institution you are. It's a main focus we have at the foundation, uh, like the mindset of leadership in all decision-making situations and positions and demonstrating examples of solutions that work and that are bringing profit and impact for society and environment further. And this demonstrating is so important and we see it with the accelerator. This is what, what we're trying to do. When Cassie is speaking about the solution, it's a, a profitable business, a sustainable business model uh, uh, for uh, a positive impact on society and economy. And showing more of these examples, I see a lot happening in Munich um, and, and uh, in, in Europe. Um, and it shows a lot of like a positive uh, vision of the future. Yeah, and I think also what is really, really interesting to, you know, a debate that's, let's say, that's out there is, is there uh, something we do different, let's say, here in Europe? Is there something different if you look at urban tech coming, let's say, from Asia or coming from the US versus how, let's say, entrepreneurship, social, ecological entrepreneurship, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, is is rooted in what what kind of values? Maybe I don't know, but also the kind of partnership approach, right? Actually, not you know being fast and breaking things, but actually being you know maybe a little bit slower, a little bit less fast, but actually making sure there's a long term partnership with cities, with different stakeholders at, at yeah. the core um, of your business model. I really believe that. So I'm a mechanical engineer. I studied in Munich, the good old uh, mechanical engineering. I'm happy to uh, went through a lot of uh, R&D and technology innovation. And I think 
there there is a big advantage in going through and being uh, every point and being very aware on the next step and not e dealing easily with data and not being and, and being a little bit concerned which is a very uh, uh, descriptive maybe like vorsichtig i don't know <laughs> uh, uh, for the german uh, uh, here in the german mentality you lose a lot of um, pace and this needs to be improved uh, but but you need to be more bold in implementing solutions. This is something that needs to be uh, tackled here. However, sustainability has been always a very core value. And, and, and this needs to be encouraged even more and in applications uh, to advance uh, solutions for climate change, etc. cetera. And, and uh, please, um, I'd like to highlight here that climate change is not the only challenge we have. There are so many societal and ed tech, like Yuri mentioned, uh, and uh, health tech challenges. So people are now focusing on climate change. We need to really consider this. But it's a big point in the competitiveness uh, uh, with the with the oil, like how you say the the, the 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 slowly but surely approach. We need just to be more bold. Yuri, what do you see in terms of on the ground also in the Kiev urban tech ecosystem or the, you know, Eastern European uh, tech ecosystem? Do you, do you see a lot of like promising things coming up, up, up and out there as well? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I think now is a gold time for innovative community for startups. Yeah, of course, pandemia gave for us a lot of uh, limits. Yeah, but from another side, pandemia gave for us uh, Blue ocean innovations, yeah, because uh, as we discussed, it, uh, we have requests for uh, absolute different solutions in all of our areas, in all of areas of our living, yeah, in medicine, in communication, in transport, in delivery, uh, in mobility, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, now I see that uh, we have very serious and very good opportunity for startup innovative community and. Uh, Uh, of course, uh, uh, in Europe, in uh, US, uh, uh, startup industry is uh, has uh, serious maturity. In UK, unfortunately, not yet. But uh, for example, we have uh, a lot of accelerators, and uh, we we have Kiev Smart City Accelerator or Accelerator of City projects. And uh, you know, I see past. Uh, Uh, for months, we received more than uh, 200 uh, startups, and uh, uh, some of them is very interesting. And uh, I'm sure that uh, they will have very big success. I also heard that there's quite some stuff going on in Lviv. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, we have uh, some centers, uh, te technological centers in Ukraine. Uh, Kyiv, Lviv, Kharkiv, Dnipro, and uh, you know that uh, in Ukraine more than 200,000 uh, developers, and uh, we have good potential, <laughs> I'm sure. And Yuri, do you do you see from again from this European perspective? Because I think it's very close also to Pascal, Christina's, my heart, and in our work of all, you know where we try to like connect the ecosystem. Like, do you think there is enough? exchange on this whole urban tech topic between let's say eastern europe and western europe um w if if not what could we improve or just from your day-to-day -day work what would you like to see improve uh you have we have absolutely different levels of uh, maturity as i told and uh, we have uh, so serious difference between uh, western europe and eastern europe and uh Uh, my opinion, uh, we should build a bridge yeah, of uh, exchanging of experience. And uh, our task is uh, to take best practice, uh, grab best practice from, uh, from you, from our colleagues uh, from Western Europe and implement immediately in uh, Ukraine. This is only uh, one right way to become the modern uh, country to build uh, Uh, smart cities and uh, to build comfortable cities for living. And Cassie, what is it from your perspective? Because, you know, let's say the dream scenario, right? We don't just build um, unicorns, we actually build impact unicorns. So I think this whole debate of also shifting like from a shareholder value to like a stakeholder value, but it all sounds great, but how do we make it happen? How, what, you know, do companies like your, yourself representing here more broadly, let's say the urban tech, entrepreneurship scene like what's still holding you back right to 
get as fast as possible, you know, from like one city to 100 cities. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a very good point because I think it's very difficult, particularly as a, a small company, um, you know, with, with, with technology uh, to be able to sort of scale quite quickly um, with, with cities, for example. Urban tech isn't always, always the most sort of, you know, obviously scalable, replicable um, um, technology. Um, but, but I think what's important is being able to, to understand where, you know, that scalability comes, where that impact um, is most relevant and and who are the partners that are able to act as for example your your first movers in the market and um, but then also your your multipliers um, and I think for example with something like the respond program um, and and BMW foundation and the work that Hiba does there that's a very good example of, of um, a multiplier for us they're willing to take the risk to support um, a relatively sort of early phase technology um, and 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 talk about it, you know. Let's say propel it forwards, um, um, bring it into circles which um, it might not otherwise be able to to come into. And I think that helps very much in in spreading our message, but in in also building up credibility. Um, now that's one side of things. Obviously, the technology has to work, <laughs> um, and you have to have the right partnerships, and you have to have the right sort of economic context um, in which to grow and to to prove and demonstrate your technology, and then roll it out and, and scale it. Um, and I think, um, for some cases, it, it's nice to, you know, to bring it back to, let's say, our home market um, in, in Munich. Although I know I, I don't sound very German, um, the Bavarian Ministry, for example, supports the um, European Space Agency um, Business Incubation Program in um, in Oberpfaffenhofen, so just outside of Munich, um, and they are trying to build and, and support a, a space tech sector there. Um, we've been supported by them um, and that has very much helped us sort of to both demonstrate and um, develop our, our technology um, and to provide that sort of scaling opportunity for us. Um, so using satellite data means we can you know, get data points across the entire globe and not just at one single city level or, or in Munich. Um, and then there are other models, let's say, um, which also help us to, to scale um, as a relatively small com uh, com company. So not just having to go city by city, but working with city alliances. So again, in, in the north of Munich, there's there's a, an alliance of cities called Nord Alliance or North um, Alliance. Um, and they are focused very much on um, the topics of digitalization, collaboration, um, citizen transparency, and, and sort of bringing together new, new collaboration opportunities. And so with that, we've been able to install one of the biggest, I think, IoT air quality networks in, in um, Europe, which is really exciting for us. Um, it's, a, you know, proving our technology. It's, it's new, customs, uh, new customers for us. And it's obviously covering more citizens. It's covering more cities um, and regions with our, with our data. Um, so it means that they can take much, much better and much more effective decisions on, on how to target air pollution. Great. And I like the... Um the emphasis in a way right you you also cannot do it alone right you need these partnerships you need these scaling partners if we talk about impact it is simply about getting stuff implemented fast and i think that's also learning from all sides involved right we don't just need the smart investors with the smart money who make sure there isn't a mission drift you know if if you want to do something good you want to like uh, tackle a social or ecological challenge but we also at the same time we need you know, startups need established players. Sometimes they call them gatekeepers. That's at least how we treat it in our work at Urban Impact that we always say, you know, we don't want to co uh, compete against the gatekeepers or like try to go around and we actually want to innovate with them. And I think that sometimes, not just in terms of impact, even from the business model perspective, it just reduces this risk of being regulated out later on, maybe out of a market, you know, because simply a lot of the business models are also... Um, you know, are just impacted by leg legislation as well. So, um, yeah, maybe just uh, my two cents. Pascal, do we have any questions from the audience? I did have one question, actually, and it might be that uh, the Q&A is not really functioning because I couldn't uh, fill in the application for myself as well. But we did receive a question, and it's had part to do with an uh, interview we did with London last week and has been published also because uh, we had a discussion with Nathan Pierce of uh, the Sharing Cities Initiative of London. And he was actually sharing, uh, explaining to us that if cities share with each other the best practices, 
uh, it seems that those practices can be deployed by multiple cities faster and also in a better way. But now we notice actually with COVID-19 that also a lot of borders are being closed. And is there more damage now on the collaboration between cities? Uh, and by being closing borders, the example was given that the technology which is required for testing on COVID-19 is quite often being invented by the countries themselves. And I see it here, eh? I'm based here in Amsterdam. I see it as well. Uh, we are very proud that a, a national institute has developed a test, even though the Danish people are, are and even the Germans are, are way better in testing. So referring back, uh, like for Kiev or Munich, do you also notice now in times like these that the sharing city initiatives, that, so that cities are sharing their best practice among each other, is uh, is slowing down or what are they doing actually to make sure that they are still sharing the best practices and i think it would be a question for for yuri but could also be heba and i think even from a corporate perspective from cassie uh but that i like to give uh, back to you yeah pa pa pascal yeah you are you're absolutely right and uh, <clears throat> of course we, when we use best practice and uh, for example for key we decided that uh, that is uh, only one uh, right way yeah, and uh, in this case, uh, of course, we increase speed of implementation of modern solution. In this case, we uh, enrich quantity of modern services for citizen. Uh, we make government more efficient. And uh, of course, we reduce cost of implementation because uh, this uh, way pass at our colleagues and they transfer this knowledge to us. And uh, this uh, allow uh, modern cities uh, to grow up faster and to build more uh, and to build smart cities faster and uh, you're absolutely right and uh, uh, from my opinion this only right uh, way uh, to build strong collaboration and strong cooperation in implementing smart city solutions yeah I would like to add, like, uh, I'm sure uh, Frau Triefs Wetter, who couldn't be here today, can tell uh, more about the city of uh, Munich. Um, of course, all, uh, like, uh, physical exchange of knowledge, etc., which needs people to be sitting in the room for uh, uh, experience transfer, etc., and the budgets, like you uh, um, uh, mentioned, are a challenge. However, there is another dynamic happening on the entrepreneurial side, and, and, and in terms of, like, um, there is an observation that innovative uh, uh, cultures and, and companies or startups with, a, with enough flexibility and dynamics, they also were able to develop a lot of solutions even faster during that time. And, and we see a lot of examples like Kraftblock, which was also a top part of the Respond Accelerator program who, was, who raised uh, his uh, funding round during the crisis time. Um, uh, or other startups who could ex uh, um, uh, scale up in other cities uh, during that time. So um, th there might be differences in what you could achieve during the crisis times. Um, a lot of solutions which were for climate or are developed for climate uh, change or for digitization when even, were even more accelerated in that time. So there are different dynamics. and. I want to go back to the point of partnerships, which uh, Jonas mentioned and Cassie also. It's so important for uh, startups and technology innovators to identify the right partners early enough, the right investors, uh, um, be aware of um, culture and the right mindset as a, a core element of success of your own startup on the long run. Like when we talk about sustainability, you need to get people on board who have uh, a, a very uh, similar value systems, etc. And going back to Una's question, the value system, which was in Munich in Europe, is, is very strong and it's uh, uh, putting people very much uh, 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 into account and their data and privacy, etc. Data privacy, etc. So this is an important point, and I, and I call for even more interactions between cities because I believe that um, borders are are really like uh, <laughs> they are a problem, but you can work despite and beyond uh, borders. Um, it's a very important thing to th thing to rethink and think in new ways 
um, pointing out also that uh, me coming from Egypt, Cairo, or people um, in other places of the planet have challenges like the ones we have during the corona time every day. And this is why they also might be even more digitally advanced than a lot of uh, cities in Europe because they had to be digital in order to cross borders for the past years. So it's a challenge, but we need to decide to, to solve it. Um, yeah. Cassie, you want to add to this? Yeah, um, yeah, very briefly, I think he was absolutely right. I mean, there are many more challenges that, you know, that, that many more people across the world are, uh, are dealing with. Um, and I think through COVID, I think certainly there have been actually more silos sort of broken down or, or you know, more partnerships enabled, um, partly because of this, this digi new digital um, sort of world order that we have at the moment. Um, but I think also increasingly um, you know, that there's, so, for example, the, the European Institute of Technology um, has a number of different accelerator programs. Nearly all of them now have a special COVID focus. Um, the European Space Agency has um, many different, very technical, very specific satellite program um, funding opportunities. But now they're, they're, they're also funding COVID related um, programs. So I think you know, there's very much a sense that the money is available um, and it flows where it is most needed. Um, and I think at the moment, obviously that's that's very much COVID and recovery and making sure that um, there is a sustainable recovery and that those who are most vulnerable to, to um, the crisis are, you know, are those which are most quickly treated and supported. Um, but there is also that message that longer term that money can be moved quite quickly um, to, to whether there is the greatest need. Um, so, so I guess we've all got hope that that the climate topic will then, you know, eventually be be the sort of next taker in the list. <laughs> About myself, I <laughs> I started riding a bike in in COVID. This was a direct COVID effect. Like I couldn't even ride a bike. I didn't grow up uh, here, and it was like what you said. It's so difficult to 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 start something new or change. But it was a complete accelerator that I decided to go buy a bike, learn riding a bike <laughs> and use it so just um, an example of how like people were moved and and inspired to change uh, due to the COVID situation yeah but I think it's a it's a wonderful example and I couldn't imagine a better ending let's say to our talk today because I think it, it shows so so nicely how you know again it's it's you know it, it's almost cliche but right you need to you need to change first and uh, you need to change your own habits you need to uh, ask can we solve the problems in a new different way and a lot this cultural transformation i think has held us um in europe back for a long time uh, you know just that we the pain wasn't big enough to you know uh, get moving change maybe question some of the things we have always done in a certain way and i feel now the pain is big enough um, we are forced to rethink how we work we are forced to rethink how we partner up how we collaborate how we innovate together and i think this can only be uh, to the benefit uh, um, you know if we want to have a, a user-centric uh, uh, you know city in the future where you know we actually try to work as a team simple as that not as, as different institutions and organizations or private, public, whatever, but actually try to solve issues as a team. Um, with that, I would maybe hand over back to you, Christina, to wrap it all up. Thank you, Ernest. And um, thank you again to our panelists. Uh, and thank you for all the attendees for joining us today for this extremely interesting discussion. And um, don't forget to visit our website, follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, and get involved. If you want to be a panelist, come and join us, come contact us and get involved. Um, you can view the recording of this uh, event and all other events on our website. So if you've missed any part, you can, you can see it there. There's also an example of the last Expert Insights documents to read, but please look out for our next one, which will be available in a few weeks, as well as other news from us in the meantime. Uh, for example, we interviewed Lisette de Metz, head of Urban at London and Partners, along with Nathan Pierce from the GLA, who's also in the Sh Sharing Cities Partnership. And uh, you can check out that interview on our website and our YouTube channel, urbantech.world. Um, the Expert Insights document will expand on the key takeaways, answer any additional questions, 
If you have additional questions now that you haven't been able to put in the chat, please send us an email, um, info at urbantech.world, and uh, we can put those to our panelists today. Um, if you want to register for the next webinar, it is the 10th of December at 2 p.m. GMT or 3 p.m. CET. Uh, get in touch and get involved. Thank you very much. And thanks again to our panelists.